Welcome to Club Book with Nicole Chung. I am Dr. Kim Park Nelson. I am a uh, professor of ethnic studies and Asian American studies at Winona State University, and I am so pleased to be here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Nicole. Uh, before I introduce this uh, tonight's guest properly, allow me to tell you a little more about the unique series that is bringing her to, her to us. Club Book is a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, made possible through Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Harbor County Library is the co-organizer for this evening's talk. Thanks also to partnering bookseller Red Balloon Bookshops. A purchase link to a living remedy will be available in the comments section of this live stream feed. Have it shipped, pick it up at their lovely store in St. Paul, or have them deliver it personally to your door if you're close in the area. One final housekeeping note, um, also in the comments, you'll see a survey link. Uh, Melissa would greatly appreciate hearing what you think of this club book program. It is quick and easy. Now for our featured event. Nicole Chung grew up as a transracial adoptee and one of the few people of color in her Oregon hometown. Her lifelong journey of self-discovery and poignant can candid writing on the subject have positioned Chung as a singular voice in memoir. In her 2018 debut, All You Can Ever Know, Chung share shares her search for her biological family, a quest she undertook while starting a family of her own. Chung's follow-up, A Living Remedy, focuses on the author's relationship with her adoptive parents, her upbringing in the working class family, and her attempts to care for her mother and father from afar while also parenting her own children. Um, the Washington Post notes, quote, Chung explores this difficult emotional terrain while delivering a powerful social commentary, posing vital questions around access to medical care and the meeting of home and family. Um, Nicole is going to be making some opening remarks and then also um, um, doing a short reading from A Living Remedy. Um, and then afterwards we'll have, then I'm going to ask her some questions. And so she and I are going to have a little conversation and then we'll also have some time for audience Q&A. So simply drop your questions in the comments thread here on Facebook um, and our tech manager will route them to me. You can also share questions with Club Book via Facebook Messenger and over email where we're at clubbookmn at gmail.com. So that's clubbook, letter M, letter N at gmail.com. Nicole, welcome. Thank you so much, Kim. It's um, a pleasure to be here in conversation with you. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody watching from home or wherever you are. Um, I know you could be doing a lot of things this evening and I'm just really honored that you've chosen to spend some time with us. Um, I thought I'd begin by talking just a little bit about A Living Remedy, which is, as Kim mentioned, a memoir of loss. Um, of legacy and adoption of class and our broken safety net. Um, and it is also a book that changed a great deal even you know, after I started writing it. Um, from the beginning, I knew this book would touch on personal collective and generational grief and the ways in which this country abdicates responsibility for the health and well-being of too many people who live here, how we scramble within our families, within our communities, um, to try to support and care for each other in the face of enormous structural failings. At its heart, it was going to be the story of my grief for my father, my adoptive father, that would um, acknowledge the systems and the safety net that failed him and, and sped his death at 67. Um, but shortly after I began working on this book with my adoptive mom's support and cooperation, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Um, and by March 2020, of course, the pandemic hit. Um, she had just started hospice care. And not only was my life recognizable, all our lives were. And at that point, I, I really couldn't think about writing. Honestly, I put the book down and didn't work on it for many, many months. I was focused on, as many people are, uh, as they get older, trying to care for and, and support my mom um, through her illness. And at a certain point, I think I realized this book would need to be rewritten um, if I could still write it at all. Because it was about my life, but also about how and why too many people lose loved ones in this country, I knew I also couldn't leave my mother's illness out of it. Um, but I also just couldn't imagine writing about it. And I don't remember the day I started writing again, like really working on it in earnest or what pushed me to do it. but like several months, I wanna say seven or eight months after she passed, I sort of threw out everything I'd already written and started over from scratch. 
So the book still goes into detail about why and how we lost my father when we did, um, you know, due in part to years of financial precarity and a lack of access to healthcare. And it's also a reckoning with class and what I always thought was my very average middle class upbringing and like how and when I realized that's not quite what it was, you know, due to medical emergencies and the fact that our family was uninsured and struggling. Um, it's also about this strange part of my identity that really changed after my dad died, being my mother's only daughter and what it meant to support and miss and try to care for and grieve for her without having access to her in the early weeks of the pandemic. And it's also about what it can mean to survive these deep losses and, and keep living, like how, how we grieve without losing ourselves, without self-recrimination or self-punishment. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a brief summary of the book and some of the themes. And I thought I would also just continue by doing a short reading um, and then we can move into the conversation. So just thank you again for being here. I'm going to read from the very beginning of the book and then I'll briefly introduce the other sections that I'm going to read. I can picture her. One pale freckled cheek resting on the yellow floral pattern pillowcase next to mine. Warm brown eyes half lidded with sleep as she listened to me talk. She was often tired in those days. After walking in the door, she'd greet me, drop her purse on a chair, and then go lie down for a while before dinner. Sometimes I'd follow her down the brown carpeted hallway to my parents' room, the second door on the right, directly across from mine, and chatter at her from the doorway or my dad's side of the bed. If she fell asleep, I'd tiptoe away. When I was little, we'd sit side by side on her bed while she told me stories about her girlhood, taught me my prayers, got me started on early cross stitch and crochet projects and read me stories she loved. A Little Princess, Anne of Green Gables, Pride and Prejudice. By the time I was a senior in high school, I was mostly just looking to talk, to tell her about my day, tests I had coming up, the school musical I wanted to try out for. I probably should have known to leave her in peace. She wasn't in good health then, which I didn't fully understand. No matter how exhausted she was, she never sent me away. I wonder if she ever thought about how soon I'd be leaving as the two of us lay on the squeaky old mattress, late afternoon sunlight filtering through the sheer brown curtains above us. I wonder if that's why she always let me gab, why she didn't tell me to go away and let her rest. Soon we'd no longer be sharing a roof and she wouldn't hear much about my individual days. Only the sum total of whatever I could remember after a full week of classes and papers and dining hall meals on a Sunday afternoon phone call made with one of dozens of calling cards she mailed to me. We would still belong to each other, but we would come to know one another differently in separation, in parting after parting. I didn't know what it would mean to leave, wouldn't begin to grasp it until my last night in my little blue childhood bedroom a few months later, when I found I couldn't sleep for terror and wonder. I'd spent most of my life in a small house in a small town, a Korean adoptee who knew I was loved but often felt as though I were living a life meant for someone else. Though dreams of escape had long held me in thrall, I missed my parents when I spent any length of time away from them. And my mom was the person I most wanted to talk to at the end of the day. I'm sure plenty of people who knew me were surprised that such a homebody only child had set her sights on a life 3000 miles away. It would be years before I'd understand that she was the one all along who'd been preparing me to go who wanted me to have the choice. 
I think of those late afternoon talks with her now that I have my own children. Knowing that the days of both of them falling asleep in their rooms down the hall from mine are dwindling. That a time will come when something trivial or life-changing will happen to them. They'll be hurt or caught by surprise or find that they're happier than they've ever been. And I will not be the first person they tell. That might be why I sometimes let them stay up past bedtime chatting with me or getting silly with each other. Why even the brightest moments on the best of days can crack my heart wide open. But then sometimes I think, well, no matter where they go, no matter how far apart we are, maybe I'll always be someone they want to talk to. Because my mother is far beyond my sight, beyond the reach of my voice. And not a day goes by when I don't think of something I wish I could tell her. Um, there's a series of, of a three lists in the book, um, which was sort of a way for me to play around a little bit with form and, and structure and honestly have some fun and give the readers what I hope service breaks in a way, places to pause and take a breath, just because I realized that the emotional terrain of the book is, is quite intense. Um, so this is the first list in the book, one of three, and I'll just read this to you as well, it's short. Um, things my mother sent me after I left home. Oregon postcards, calling cards, cash when she had any to spare, vitamins, ballpoint pens and mechanical pencils, lip balm, sunscreen, my favorite Girl Scout cookies. Enough Werther's Originals, Brock's Peppermints and saltwater taffy for everyone in my dorm to help themselves from my free for all candy dish. A two foot tall artificial Christmas tree with decorations. Warm socks, knit gloves, wool scarves, she was very concerned that I was too soft for East Coast winters. DVDs of my two favorite movies, Singing in the Rain and Casablanca. Seashells and sand dollars. Articles of potential interest snipped from the local newspaper. A flashlight, a safety whistle, pepper spray. Photos of her and dad and grandma on every birthday and holiday I missed. Uh, this last short reading I'll do really gets to the heart of um, the discussion of healthcare and the, the broken safety net in our country. Um, this part takes place after my father's passed away uh, at 67 from diabetes and kidney disease. Many weeks later, a friend calls it a common American death. We're in her car on our way to dinner, speaking of various health conditions that run in our families. Both of us have seen our loved one's medical problems exacerbated by financial insecurity and inaccessible medical care. She says what happened to my father was tragic and we talk about how it might have been prevented if he'd gotten the help he needed. How many people here, she says, die for the exact same reason every day. I think of how many times I've heard terminal illness and death referred to as equalizers, as if they can flatten our differences and disparities simply because they come for all of us sooner or later. Sickness and grief throw wealthy and poor families alike into upheaval, but they don't transcend the gulfs between us as some claim. If anything, they often magnify them. Who has the ability to make choices others lack? Who's left to scramble for piecemeal solutions in an emergency? If you have no rainy day savings or paid medical leave, if your support system's scant or under-resourced, if preventative or life-saving treatments harder for you to access or altogether out of reach, you'll have a profoundly different experience from those who become ill or find themselves caring for sick or dying loved ones, knowing that if nothing else, they can afford to meet the moment. This is a country that takes little responsibility for the health and well being of its citizens while urging us to blame each other and ourselves for our precarity under an exploitative system in which 
all but a small number of us stand to suffer or lose much. It's still hard for me not to think of my father's death as a kind of negligent homicide, facilitated and sped by the state's failure to fulfill its most basic responsibilities to him and others like him. With our strained systems of care and support, and the deep and corrosive inequalities we've yet to address, it's no wonder so many of us find ourselves struggling to get help we need when we or our loved ones are suffering. What killed my father on paper was diabetes and kidney failure. Common deaths indeed, the eighth and 10th leading causes in the United States in 2020, according to the CDC. But failing organs, life-threatening infections, death in his 60s, these weren't inevitable outcomes, nor matters of pure chance and inheritance, an avalanche of genetic misfortune. He needed access to quality health care in order to manage his illnesses, and he needed it throughout his life, not only in his final years, when it was granted as a crisis response after his kidneys failed. For her part, for reasons I'll never comprehend, my mother assigns herself some blame. She knew he was slowing down. Should she have realized his death was close? Had she missed important signs? If she'd known more, could she have done more for him? I beg her not to think that way. It's not her fault. I want to ask if she or dad blame me for being so far away, for not being able to help more. But I realize I'm afraid to hear the answer, and the question seems too great a burden to add to one she already carries. What I feel isn't pure self-recrimination. I know his illness wasn't my fault either. But the regret and anger I bear is a constant ache, so entwined with my grief that I can't begin to parse where one feeling ends and another begins. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole, for reading from your book. Um, I think that there's so much there's so much to unpack, even in just what you have shared in your reading today. Um, I have many questions for you, and I know that um, I know that uh, our listeners also have many questions for you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get into that. Um, so my first question is really you kind of talked about it a little bit as you're introducing yourself and you're kind of difficulties in writing and not writing um, as a result of what you're experiencing with what your parents are going through. I really appreciate how you have um, layered and interlayered that with all these other things that were happening also to, to you, but also to all of us during that kind of historic period. Um, and so I guess the first question is really about um, what made you, I mean, I know that you're a memoirist, um, but what made you kind of decide like that you wanted to tackle the um, the topic of the loss of your parents? Um, and I'm also curious about the title, Living Remedy. Remedy. And so can you talk a little bit about um, that title and how it's kind of, and how, like, you know, how it's connected or not connected to your decision to tackle this very personal, very difficult um, topic as a memoirist? Yes, and thank you for that question. Um, I mean, it's true I'm someone who, uh, not just in books, but in essays, in like a newsletter, um, in other forms, like I am someone who writes about my own personal experience um, quite a lot. I think in, in one sense, like, I don't really do it so much to make you think about like specific events in my life. I always hope that if people read my essays or read my memoirs, um, I think what's what's really meaningful about this genre is that it can be a place where as readers, we can meet ourselves, right? And so I'm hoping that you'll think, you'll think about your own experience when you read my work. In the case of this book, um, you'll think about like people that you've loved and your own losses um, and leave takings and what, what that has meant to you. Um, so I, I, I think the genre kind of justifies its existence in a way by, um, by doing just that, by meeting readers where they are, hopefully by reaching out to them and making them feel less alone and giving them a chance to reflect on their own experiences. Um, so that's why I write in the genre more broadly. I wanted to write about grief 
Um, because honestly, I couldn't think about anything else. You know, after my father died, it was this all-consuming experience. It, it's not that I hadn't experienced other forms of grief before, I, I had, but um, this was the first major loss of like a loved one in my life. And it's just a cataclysm. I, it changed me entirely. Um, it, I could see how it was changing my mother. And um, I was just, one thing that I was really surprised by was my own anger. Um, not just that he was gone, but the ways in which his death had really been sped by these, by these structural failings that I've talked about and read about by, um, you know, the fact that he was poor and uninsured for many years. Um, it's interesting, my adoptive mom and I were very far apart politically and ideologically, but there was, and we were both united in this strong feeling that, you know, his death at 67 wasn't inevitable. Um, and at the same time, when my friend said it was such a common American death and she talked about like some of her own experiences, like I knew she was right, that it is, it is all too common um, in a country that doesn't really take responsibility for the health and well-being of its citizens. Like I know so many people and families who've had similar experiences and yet it wasn't really something I had seen tackled head on in a lot of grief narratives. Um, you know, I was reading like different grief memoirs and I've, it's just, a, it's a topic that has interested me for a long time. Um, certainly I've read a lot of really powerful writing, but I really hadn't seen anyone um, like confronting this aspect of, of my grief and of the way so many people like lose loved ones um, and some of the root causes of those losses. And I thought if I write about this and the fact that I'm learning like not to blame myself for these structural failings, right? Not to blame myself for things that weren't really my fault. Um, maybe it will help other people or just like who are going through similar things. Maybe it will make them feel less alone or maybe it'll just be a good companion to people who are grieving and thinking about these things. So that was why um, why I started to feel sort of called to write, it, write about it. Um, first sort of in a couple of essays and then, um, and then like I started thinking about a book project. Um, so that was that was really where the idea came from. For the, the title, A Living Remedy. So I mentioned um, like I before this before we started, Kim, I mentioned to you I was reading a lot of poetry while I worked on this book. And um, one of the poets who's meant a great deal to me for a long time is Marie Howe. Uh, so a living remedy is a phrase that is borrowed from one of her poems and um, the, the the short little line that I actually quote in the epigraph of the book is is because even grief provides a living remedy. Um, I don't think Marie Howe writes so brilliantly about grief and about about loving people and about difficult relationships um, and about what if anything we can look to for comfort. And uh, so her work's meant a lot to me for a long time, but there was something about that phrase, a living remedy that really jumped out at me um, because I knew from my own experience of grieving that of course we don't seek grief out, like nobody would, would do that, but when it comes for all of us and it does, um, I had learned that like grieving is so important, like actually letting yourself feel the pain um, and, not doing whatever you can to just escape it. Um, I did that for a long time after my father died. Just, it was so painful that I, I just would have done anything to get away from it. And eventually I realized while trying to avoid that pain, I really wasn't allowing myself to grieve. And without grieving, I don't think that there's a chance for like healing um, or the beginnings of healing. So that was why I was drawn to the title. I ended up writing to Marie actually to ask her for permission to use it, which she generously granted. Um, and so, I mean, here we are. I'm really grateful to her for allowing me to do that because um, I love the title. I really do. I love the title too. Um, so this is a little bit of a follow-up question. Um, one of the things that I really, to what I just asked you, one of the things that really, um, struck me as I was reading the memoir was, you know, because of the timing of the loss of your parents, um, this all, it kind of happened as COVID was ramping up. Your mother died during COVID. Your father died, I believe, 
shortly before COVID. Is that correct? Uh, 2018. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, that really struck me because I also, like my mother died right before COVID and then my grandfather, who I was really close to, died during COVID. And so um, I think, and I think maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm thinking about this question. Um, I was thinking about this question as I was reading the memoir. Um, I mean, I think that we are still figuring out all what we lost collectively because of COVID during the last four years. Yes. Um, but you know, I thought a lot about what it meant to lose family members during COVID, and I'm guessing that you have too. I'm wondering if um, what losing your parents during this particular time, this kind of like weird, unprecedented time in sort of modern history, um, shaded how you experienced COVID or vice versa, like how living through this during COVID, you know, living living through your the loss of your parents kind of as COVID was going on, like made you think differently about their passing. I mean, that's, it's such a complicated question, even though they they died only two years apart, which is like incredibly close. Um, it felt like two different worlds, you know, like because my father died in 2018 before COVID and my mom died like in the spring of 2020. Um, and I'm sure I don't need to remind you all, like you can think back and remember what that spring was like, like how little we knew, nobody was going anywhere. There were stay at home orders slash requests. Um, I, I wasn't, like, I mean, like so many people who lost a loved one, especially in that first year of COVID, I wasn't able to be with her at the end. Um, I had to live stream her funeral. Um, you know, and, and countless people had that that same experience. It, so it was so strange. It was so different. With my father, I had like a much more, what I think of now as a traditional grieving experience. I flew out there. I was at the funeral. There was no uh, attendance cap on the funeral. It was um like full of people full of friends and family like full of life in a way and of course I was devastated but there was something about being there like with my mom with my um my biological sister with whom I'm in reunion was there supporting me and my mom during that um being there with my parents like friends and community going through these rituals that I knew would have meant so much to my dad that I knew meant a lot to my mother um just all of those things were sort of guideposts for me in grieving. And I think they really helped me and my children who came with me, like see and understand and experience and begin to grasp like the magnitude of the loss. Um, and with my mother, it was entirely different. I mean, um, we, we talked or uh, had video calls all the time, but it was really difficult, especially toward the end and then uh, only a, a handful of people could go to her funeral in person and I've, other people live streamed in. So uh, it was a very like 2020 kind of experience. And I was grieving in many ways, kind of in isolation. Um, I remember the live feed from her funeral, like cutting out. And I was still, you know, I was sitting on my living room couch with my, with my, my husband and daughters. It's true. But um like we were alone and I didn't see anyone else for the rest of the day, probably not for the rest of that week. Um, just like, like a strange, surreal, like very lonely grieving experience. And at the same time, what I'll say about that is I was really surprised at how um, friends and family from around the country who couldn't be there and couldn't be with me, like showed me their love and support. Um, I was thinking all the time too about like how I could be there for people I knew were struggling and they were doing the same for me. I think because of the pandemic, the time we were living through um, and the fear everyone had, everyone was grieving some kind of loss or some kind of disappointment. Even if it was just, I thought my life was this one thing and I missed the way like normal life used to be, you know? Um, and so no one had to dig very deep, I think, to understand what I was going through. It felt different when I lost my dad. There was this sense of like the world was just going on without him. And to me, it felt like inherently wrong. I'm sure other people who've grieved can like relate to that feeling. Like how, how come the world hasn't stopped, you know? And losing my mom when and how I did, um, in a sense, the world was stopped. And like there was so much that was horrible about that timing, right? Not that there's ever good timing. It's never a good time to, to lose a loved one or grieve, but I had so much time and um, 
everyone I knew was really trying to think about ways to like to be in community and to show support and love to each other, even though like without physical presence. Um, and so I ended up feeling really held and really supported, you know, by my community, even though they weren't with me in person. Um, it, it got me thinking a lot like at that time. And I've continued to think about like what it means, how we can support and kind of show up for each other, even in circumstances that are far from ideal. Um, so I don't know, that was, that was kind of a long way of answering your question, but I think like I'm still thinking about, about the lessons for lack of a better word, kind of of that time and like what grief taught me. Um, I think it's made me more empathetic like to others who are grieving for sure. And it's, it's really driven home just the importance, I think, of not looking away from pain, like our own pain, but also other people's pain. I think there's a lot of pressure in our society right now to like not look back and think about like our collective losses of the past few years, but instead just kind of keep pressing forward. Um, but I don't think we can or we should forget these things and, and people we've lost and preventable deaths. I don't think that that's something we should look away from. Nicole, um, I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'm gonna to turn to some um, reader questions and listener questions. Um, but so most people, many, many people watching probably don't know me. I'm an adoption researcher um, of about 20 years. And so of course, like one of the things that I was really kind of cued into as I was reading both of your memoirs was, um, was, you know, to what degree are you speaking to the adoptee population and the, how are adoptees like reading your work, which I know many of them are. And so, um, but really one of the things that kind of struck me as a moment is that I, you know, was also kind of like I was noticing in your book is like, as I mentioned before, um, I'm of an age also where I've also lost parents. I, many of my Korean adoptee friends have lost parents just because of our ages, because we're sort of like, you know, entering middle age. Um, grieving the loss of your parents is like something that's very individual, but it's also practically universal, right? If things go as they should, like you're, you should live past um, the life, lives of your parents. And so I don't know if the audience knows this, but Nicole, I'm sure you know this, the um, Korean adoptee population is this kind of like bell-shaped curve that peaked, um, that kind of started in the 50s and kind of peaked during the mid 80s. So what that means is um, a big group of Korean adoptees is now reaching middle age and many of us are starting to lose our parents. And so um, I'm wondering, since you have, like as you're writing the book or since you finished the book, if you have thoughts about how your adoption related losses are kind of, and those experience, the experiences related to that have kind of intersected with the loss of your parents. Um, I know that this is something that, you know, many Korean adoptees um, are going through or are going to be going through in the near future. And so, you know, I know that you have a big audience among adoptees and probably particularly among Korean adoptees. And I'm kind of wondering if you have any thoughts on that question. Yeah, I mean, it, one other reason I, I kind of wanted to write about this is because of that intersection of adoption, loss and, and grief. Um, like I knew, I knew it would bring up things for me. I noticed it like when my father died, just like little comments that people would make without thinking like someone, and this is from someone who didn't know I was adopted. I write about this in the book, but they said like, they were trying to be comforting. And they said like, you'll always see him like in you and your children, um, you know, like when you look in the mirror. And of course, like that's never been the case with me. Like I'm a, um, a Korean adoptee raised in a white family. And so it's not, of course, that we didn't love each other or like don't have those connections, but like it wasn't a physical resemblance. Um, and I don't know, I, I shouldn't have been so surprised and yet I was to find that um, a different kind of grief sort of triggers my adoption grief. Uh, for it, Every time I think I've sort of dealt with adoption, um, I, something else happens to me. Like I, I remember when I had a child, it was like obviously this huge moment that intersected with like my search for my birth family. Um, and it's, it's kind of similar with losing my adoptive parents. I've thought so much about like what it means to be an adoptee still, whose adoptive parents are no longer here. Um, I am obviously still an adoptee. That experience has shaped my life and will continue to, but the people 
that like I have this defined relationship with like that particular link or you know they are gone and there was this moment after my mom passed when my my cousin my adoptive cousin um you know he was asking me like how I was and it the word just slipped out kind of unthinking I said like it feels like being unadopted in a way it feels like my adoption is like dissolving um I was not trying to be dramatic I think if I were to talk about it today I wouldn't use that term but at the time it felt so emotionally true um because I didn't just lose my parents um I had just lost my adoptive grandmother and nearly everyone in my adoptive family that I'd ever been in, in touch with or close to um and I was very conscious of carrying like this legacy and all these memories alone with, with really no one who like remembered my childhood or could talk up with me about my adoption within my family. Like all those people were, were gone. So I've, it's just been something that I continue to think about and think about um, in a way those relationships aren't over, but they, they're certainly different now. And I, the way I define myself as an adoptee will probably like shift as well, given the fact that my adoptive parents are no longer here. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm still, I'm still learning about it, but I did want to write the book in part because, um, because I, I, I have wanted as an adoptee to see more writing about adoption and about grief and about parental loss. Um, and just like what, what that can mean for us and how it can trigger like adoption loss as well, like feelings around that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't started hearing it from like large numbers of adoptees about this particular book, but I do hope like for those who are going through like either trying to care for our parents or elders or just, um, or who have, you know, lost, lost adoptive family already. Um, I hope it can be like a good companion for them, even though I don't have like firm answers. Nicole for that for the answer to that question I think that um, it's interesting since I since I read the book I have been in contact with several adoptees who have lost their parents just in the couple of months you know since I started reading the book and so I do think that there is going to be this you know at least in the Korean adoptee community like this big wave because the you know the big population of Korean adoptees I mean I'm a little bit older than them I think maybe you're a little bit older than them but um, you know, they're kind of entering their 40s now. And so I just because of like, developmentally, like where we are in life, I think we're going to start seeing uh, much, much more of that. So um, I'm going to turn now we have about 20 minutes left, I'm going to turn to some um, reader questions. Um, the first question that I have um, from a reader is, um, I'm, I'm just going to read it here, but I, I'm going to, I think that I'm going to try to give a little bit of context because I think that this is, this person is asking about is not entirely clear. So the question okay. is your exploration of America, of American healthcare is heartbreaking and eye-opening. Um, I'm curious if execution of the second memoir required exploring that industry through written resources or subject matter experts to better understand and contextualize your parents' story. And so I feel like this question is kind of about research, mm -hmm. right? It's about the research that you did to, um, to write this memoir. Um, I think that a lot of people sort of assume like if you're writing a memoir, you're just writing about your own, own experience, which of course you were, but um, I mean, I also noticed this in reading both of your memoirs that you often kind of take um, you take other people's perspectives in your memoirs, which I thought was like so interesting. But um, but I think this question is a great one about, you know, how much research did you end up doing into the healthcare industry um, and the failures of the healthcare industry in order to write this memoir? Thanks for that question, um, whoever submitted it. So, I mean, it's not a deeply reported or researched book, um, but I did do a fair bit of research like into the um, both the specifics of my parents' situation, which required kind of going through documents and records and sometimes emails that like letters we'd exchanged. Um, and I, ha I kept a journal, well, I'm a lifelong journaler, which has been helpful. Um, but I also kept a journal specifically related to like my mother's illness when I was helping to keep track of her, um, like what was happening with her illness, what her treatment options were. It, it was so anxiety producing and so like devastating. I knew if I didn't write things down, I would forget or I wouldn't be able to convey the information to her. Um, and part of my role as her daughter was taking this like very dense sort of medical information and distilling it and giving it to her 
in digestible chunks because understandably she was really overwhelmed. Um, and so I have like pages and pages, like there were days when I would talk to doctors for hours and end up with like pages of notes. Um, and like, I, I turned back to those and those were really helpful. I had researched like the particulars of my dad's diagnosis, but also um, like average life expectancy once your kidneys fail um, and how like dialysis, like treatment works, how it would have worked for his mother who shared, who had the same disease as he did and, and died from similar causes, but um, like decades earlier. Um, she actually had like more access to treatment, life-saving treatment for a longer period of time than he did in the 60s and 70s um, and 80s than my father had like in the 21st century. And I thought that was notable. Um, and I remember researching things like what would her options have been in terms of kidney transplants? When was the first living kidney transplant? Um, would that have been available to her? Um, if my father had chosen that, like what would that process have looked like for him? And these, some of these things were things I had un undoubtedly discussed with them, but hadn't like written down, like hadn't committed to memory. And so the research part was important because it allowed me to fill in like accurate medical details. Um, you know, even though I don't always remember specifics of like conversations we had about these things. Um, I had mentioned that even the section I read tonight, I'd mentioned, you know, diabetes and kidney disease being, I think the eighth and 10th leading causes of death um, in the country at the time my father died. It was important for me to know exactly how common was this, is this. Um, so those are just some examples. Um, I also spent some time researching the safety net that my parents like weren't able to access, not just Medicaid, um, the Oregon Health Plan was their state Medicaid program, but also things like food and rental assistance um, and just other forms of like uh, program, other programs that could have helped them, but that they um, weren't eligible for, for different reasons, just to make sure I had all those details correct. Um, so that's an example of some of the research that I did. I, I could probably think of more if I kept going. Um, but just because a book is memoir and it's based on personal experience definitely doesn't mean that there isn't research involved to make sure to make sure you're telling the story accurately. Well, um, here's a question from somebody who I think is maybe thinking about writing memoir themselves. Um, this person says, you're an inspiration. What advice would you have for an aspiring memoir memoirist, someone who feels they have a hard but important story to bring to the page and into the world? Um, I feel like this question has ask, asking for a friend vibes. <laughs> no, I mean, thank you for that, uh, for, both for the kind kind words and also the, the question. Um, it's hard because of course everyone's story is different and everyone's relationship to their writing. I mean, if they're a writer is different, even mine has shifted a lot over the years. Um, I think I've learned a lot more grace and patience for myself and I've incorporated a lot more like rest and care and thoughtfulness into my writing routine in ways that has really helped make it stronger and sustain it. Uh, so I will talk a little about that too, but um, just general things. I mean, first of all, um, something I say to everybody who's considering writing about hard things or about trauma or about grief is that, it's important I think, to know you don't owe the world these stories. Like if you really feel called to write them you want to write them and share them publicly, there will definitely be readers who care, who like it matters to. Um, I know it can really make a difference. And at the same time, I think, um, you know, I think sometimes, I think it's important to remember too that like it's always okay to to follow fun or to follow joy or to write about your quirky obsessions like I think especially as like writers from marginalized backgrounds who are whose stories tend to be underrepresented in the literary landscape just like be aware that you can write about anything and that we want more than your trauma like we do want your joy um so that that is one thing and just like knowing when you're ready to tackle something hard not just write about it, but put it out there for the world. Um, I've shared this elsewhere, but there's a reason I didn't publish my first book, All You Can Ever Know, till I was in my mid thirties, mid to late thirties. Some of that was the market. It was a hard sell, a book by an adoptee at that point. Uh, but also I wasn't quite ready. There were things I hadn't really worked through on my own. Um, there were things that I just needed more time to reflect on. There were relationships like in my birth family with my birth family that were still forming. Um, and I don't think it would have been 
the book it needed to be if I had like rushed into telling it too soon. Um, I was several years past like a lot of the events in that first book before I wrote it. And what that also meant was that when I started getting reader feedback, um, which I should say, I've been really lucky. It's been like overwhelmingly positive and generous and kind. But of course, if you put something out there, you're gonna get other reactions too. And things people have said to me about being an, an adoptee, about what they assume my relationship with my adoptive family must be like. Um, some of those comments would have devastated me getting them, I don't know, 15 years ago. But by the time I published that book, it's not that I love getting comments like that, but like they don't have the same power to hurt me. I'm just in a different place in my life. I am much more secure in a lot of my relationships and what I think and feel about my adoption and know to be true and valid. So um, in that case, I'm glad I waited. And I'm not saying you have to wait some huge number of years like I did. I just mean, be ready um, and know that you are ready and take care of yourself as best you can. Try to treat yourself humanely in your writing practice. You're more than the work you produce um, and you deserve to be okay, you know, um, and take care of yourself, even as you're telling really hard stories. I'm going to choose a question here from um, one of somebody listening tonight from Tasha. Um, and I, this is kind of a follow up, I think, to the question that you just answered, or at least in my mind, it can be a follow up to the question you just answered. Um, the question is, do you find that injury hard emotionally to re-experience as you write? And I guess like my kind of corollary to that question is, or is the writing down these stories and writing down these memories more of an act of healing or is it kind of both? That's a good question. They're both good questions. Um, I'm personally not a writer who finds writing for public consumption cathartic. Um, so like I have writing that I do that is more for me that like you could consider therapeutic in that way. Like I mentioned, I'm a lifelong journaler. I write a lot for myself. I write to process things. Most of that writing never sees the light of day. Like it is for me and there's great value in that. But by the time I, I set out to write a story, like a book, like a living remedy, which I know will be like in front of people's eyes, um, I'm not really thinking about myself so much or my emotions or my processing. I've already done that work. I'm thinking much more about the reader, how you all will receive it if you, you know, hopefully you can, um, whether there is something for you to really hold on to and carry with you, um, whether I can make a very personal story like universal or relatable enough to matter to others and whether it will be like good company to people. Um, I always want anything I write to be, I want the reader to feel cared for and I want you to know that I've thought of you and I want it to be um, good company for you. So um, I would say like no to the part about like the writing of this book being healing, um, but like as a, you know, addendum, in order to write it, I really had to learn to be more patient with myself and to show myself more care in my work. I've always been sort of a nose to the grindstone kind of writer and worker. Um, even when I was grieving my dad, I realized at a certain point, like I was hiding in my work. I like tended to do that. Um, but this book just required a lot more patience. And there were many times I didn't know if I could really write it or I didn't know if I could finish it, but I was trying even more than I was trying to finish it. I was trying to be okay and to take care of myself and my family. I think taking that time, spending that care, believing I was worthy of it and my writing practice also deserved it made the experience of writing it so different than anything else, even my first book, which is very much a nose to the grindstone. I wrote it at all hours. I wrote it every weekend kind of book. This book was different. Um, I took my time. I incorporated a lot more like care and rest into my practice. And I think it serves the writing. I think that shows. I don't think this would be the book it needed to be if I hadn't learned to treat myself like a human being in my writing. And so I'm grateful to this book for that, for sure. Um, and regarding the question, I think about, um, let me see, whether it was sort of hard, uh, like emotionally to re-experience these things or to write about them. Um, sometimes, yeah, I think so. And that's why like, I did try to give myself breaks. Um, if I wrote like a very difficult scene or chapter, I would not necessarily like force myself to jump back in to the story like 
later that day or the next day. I might give myself a few days um, or work on a different section of the book. Um, in terms though of like, I mean, I will say too, sometimes it was, um, sometimes it was really meaningful. Sometimes it was really comforting to do that memory work and spend that time again, like with my parents in a way, because in order to write this book, I had to kind of channel who they were. Uh, I had to like hear their voices and try to make those come alive on the page. And it was painful because I missed them, but it was also really meaningful and sometimes beautiful to spend that time. Um, and my, one of my, like, I don't think it's a trick or a hack, but like what I learned through this book sometimes was that if a memory was too hard to recall, and if I couldn't be sure I could share the emotion super faithfully, um, I would try to remember how a given moment or experience like felt in my body. And I would describe like physically how it felt. There's like, there's one scene I can think of in particular where I'm on the phone with my mother and I'm, I have to give her this really devastating news. Um, and instead of saying like how I felt, I described like physically what it was like, like living through those moments. Um, and that became, it turned out that was like a far more effective way, I think, of, of making it clear to the reader of like painting a picture. Um, and somehow it was easier to write it that way, just like writing it almost as a physical experience and not, and letting that convey the emotion instead of trying to find adequate words for this um, in many ways indescribable feeling. Um, thank you for the questions. This is probably going to be the last question that we have time for. Somebody has asked about the cover of the book, which I actually see behind you on your shelf, assuming that's a real background and not a... It is. <laughs> and not like a, a dropped in background. Um, I don't know how much control you have over what's on the cover of your book, um, but the question is, um, could you share the symbolism behind, behind the cover art? It's beautiful, um, but I'm sure there's layers of meaning I am missing. Um, can you talk a little bit about, did you, what was the process of kind of coming to this cover and what, what does the, what, what's the meaning in the cover for you or what's the, what are the meanings in the cover that you can talk to us about? Sure, I'll hold it up again just for people who like couldn't see it, but um, there's like a stack of, of river rocks is what they're intended to be with like a white line connecting them. And then the two middle rocks, instead of looking like rocks, they've been replaced with like ocean. And these are, um, these are pine trees because <laughs> uh, I grew up in Oregon. And so it is like the most Oregon cover, even the spot, the background, the sky, that is like what Oregon sky looks like, like kind of blue, but also could rain at any moment. Um, I'm not an artist and I definitely didn't design this book. Um, it was designed by an artist named Vivian Lopez Rowe, um, who like in just one of those funny, it's a small publishing world things. Uh, we used to work together many years ago uh, when I worked for an independent publisher. Vivian was like, I want to say an intern or a fellow there. Um, and she's gone on to have this brilliant editorial illustration career. So I was really happy it was her. Um, that was just like pure chance. And um, I, I also wasn't the art director, but like I was asked for preferences and I mentioned, you know, if it could in some way allude to the Northwest or um, I like cool colors more than warm colors, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so there's a line, there's a part in the book where I mentioned my dad had loved river rocks, like collecting them. He would go and get like actually bigger ones and like put them in his, his, his garden, like to, he would use them um, to like line the edges of his hosta garden <laughs> and his rose gardens. And so um, I think Vivian picked up on that. So that's where the rocks come from. Um, the fact that they're all kind of connected in a line, it's like generational legacy. Um, the two that are, I believe the two that are uh, sort of um, the ocean and the, the pine trees. I mean, I think they're supposed to represent my, my parents. Um, and the other two that are still rocks would be like me and um, like other members of my family, you know, still part, still connected and part of that legacy. Um, so that was like really where that came from. I, 
I um, I love the design, but I didn't have that much to do with it personally, other than like, you know, giving a tiny bit of feedback here or there. Um, but I think Vivian did a, a brilliant job with it. I really love it. Actually, I think I lied a little before. I think we have just enough time for a quick answer to this question, which I think is a great one. This is from Marissa, who's listening um, about um, your kids. If when if your children read your books, what do you um, know or hope or hope how you'll handle these? So I think it's like the question is about how will how do you hope your children really will react to reading your your memoirs someday. So my older daughter has read um, my first book. We read it together, like back when it came out, um, and <laughs> it was it was really like sweet. So I mean, she I ended up getting her the ebook edition too, and like the dedication of that book is for Cindy, who's my sister, my uh, who with whom I reunited. Um, it's for Cindy and for our daughters because I have two and she has one. <laughs> like my daughter, I saw at one point my daughter had highlighted it and like written, um, that's me, I'm Nicole Chung's daughter, which was like really cute. Um, but she, no, she's always been um, like, I mean, I haven't like hidden the things that I've written, especially she's gotten older. Like she has a phone, she can find anything she wants. I try to be extremely, like as respectful as I can be of the kid's privacy. So like eagle-eyed readers of A Living Remedy will notice I never actually mentioned their names. Um, you know, they go unnamed here and that's deliberate. Um, and I'm, I'm, I've started reading it with my older daughter, but I think that um, like we haven't gotten super far. I wanna say like a quarter of the way through. Um, and the first time through, I like I like her to read it with me. And then after that, you know, she can reread as much or as little as she wants to. But I want to try to be available for questions. One, she did read any section that had anything to do with her ahead of time. So like, I don't I never want anybody to be surprised uh, or like have the first time they see themselves in the book be like when they're reading it and it's like been pulled off the shelf. Like I so everyone that I'm close to, like in my family gets copies like way ahead of time and then we have a chance to talk about it and like it's not a spoiler to say that my my daughter kind of features prominently like in the very the very end of a living remedy and i made sure she read that and was okay with kind of what i had shared um so that's partly how i handle it uh you know thinking about privacy thinking about like informed consent to being on the page at all um and then just trying to um as I write, like not, not define my children's experiences. Like I can, I don't know how to write about my life without mentioning my loved ones, but I try very hard not to say like, that I know what certain experiences meant to them. I try really hard not to define their experience for them. That is their story. And it's their job to do that if, you know, for themselves. Um, but, you know, one reason I am glad I've written both books is that you know, in the first book, this record of how and why I searched for my birth family and how my sister and I discovered each other and put our families back together, like, or part of our family, like that, that was a legacy I was really conscious of wanting to pass on to my children, to our children. Um, and in A Living Remedy, I mentioned before, like in a way it's a place where my parents still live and you can hear their voices and maybe not the sum total, but like the essence of who they were and how I knew them as parents, like exists in the story. My children may not remember them as well, you know, as I wish they could, but they'll have this book. Um, and I hope it's also a place where they can like meet and remember their grandparents if they ever want to do that. So I'm afraid we're out of time um, and that's all we have time for tonight. So thank you so much again, Nicole, for including us in your very busy book tour and fall schedule. Um, this has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long running literary series of MELSA made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund here in the state of Minnesota. Thanks again to the Carver, Carver County Library for the part they played in bringing Nicole to us. Before you log off, look for the club book survey link, which is in the comments and will be projected in place of my video momentarily. Last, consider joining club book on Monday, October 23rd for their next for our next virtual program featuring award-winning filmmaker and memoirist Curtis Chin. His anticipated debut memoir, Everything I Learned, I Learned in a Chinese Restaurant, hit shelves just today. You can learn more about that and the other upcoming events at clubbook.org. 
Have a great night, everyone.